Welcome back, AP. All right, welcome back. And I am trying to keep my voice at a reasonable volume so I don't like disturb the natural order of, the order of things over here because this little boy apparently has been freaking out since I've been home and been yelling and hollering and stuff like that. But again, wanted to give you a huge shout out for being so awesome today. Y'all absolutely killed it. We did the best we absolutely could with virtual teaching, of course, mainly just due to the fact that it's like just kind of tough in general and whatever. But it is important to get this flip in so we can make sure we're staying on track and staying where we need to go, right? Loved y'all's like, uh, like your back and forth during like the political spectrum stuff that we did in your notes. Like it's going to be very important that you understand who those conservatives are, who those classical liberals are, and who those socialists are as well. And we're going to kind of dive a little bit further in with the socialists today, talk about like some of their earliest like proponents, these guys named like Saint-Simon and Foyer and Foyerism and like stuff like that, or as Annabella probably calls it, it's like, oh, hey, oh, like yourself, or something, whatever you want to get at. But the big thing about it is, is let's stay on Metternich for a minute, right? Let's keep talking about Metternich. Let's keep talking about this age of Metternich. How'd this guy pull this off, right? How did he pull off 33 years of continuous peace when they just got done with 25 years of straight war because of the start of the world, the war, the first coalition, and then preceded by the Seven Years' War, the Anglo-Dutch Wars, the War of Austrian Secession, the War of Spanish Secession, and all those things that y'all pulled off the top of your heads, which was bananas, Pierre. It was bananas that those girls could name those 10 wars just like that, right? So, like, it was just crazy. Now, so the big reason, though, is why are y'all like this, right? So, like, why are these conservatives like this? Why are they, like, and remember, quick disclaimer, I'm not saying current conservatives or whatever. I'm saying conservatives during the 1800s, right? Why are you like this? Why don't you want people to have natural rights? Why don't you want people to be able to own property of their own? Why don't you want people to be able to vote, right? So, like, why don't you want them to do these things? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that most of the people, including Metternich and himself, those conservatives are born into land-holding nobility, right? They're born into land-holding nobility. They come from aristocratic privilege. They come from noble privilege. It's all they know, right? They only know that the way things have always been done or the way the, or the way that things were kept safe and peaceful, even though, ironically enough, even though during the absolutist era, there was still a heavy amount of war and a heavy amount of death and a lot of really de big death and destruction and also a huge amount of racism and the slave trade and stuff like that. So yet again, we've got this problem of nostalgia, right? Like a big thing about it is Clemens von Metternich, if he was writing movies today, he would be doing remakes of everything because he's a a big nostalgia guy, right? And so a big thing of it connects even to his roots. Where is he from? Who is he? Where did he come from? Well, the thing about it is, he's remember those old princes from the Holy Roman Empire that doesn't even exist anymore? Well, he is one of the leftovers of those old, like, old princes. So the Holy Roman Empire princes aren't even a thing anymore. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. We'll talk about like the provinces going from like over 90 to just 30 and stuff like that. But he is one of those leftovers of that land-holding nobility class from the Holy Roman Empire during the time of the Holy Roman Empire. He had a brilliant political career in Austria, and he rose through the ranks using his abilities and also a lot of nepotism to become the Austrian foreign minister, right? So he worked directly underneath the royal family, and he did this while believing in a very Hobbesian view of people, right? So let's delineate that really quick, okay? He has a Hobbesian view of people, as in, if people are left to their own vices, they will destroy the ab the world, right? And, like, he's not completely wrong in what he just witnessed, right? He witnessed a popular uprising. He witnessed the death of monarchs. He witnessed the death of feudalism in France. Like, he witnessed all these things happening in France while they were having their revolution. And he believes the way that Hobbes believes, that people cannot protect themselves, that they need to give their rights over to a very, very, like, large leader or an absolutist in favor of that system rather than being in favor of republics or universal suffrage or anything like that. But the reason why I have let's delineate on there is why would a guy support absolutism when he's a landholding noble that they were always suppressed by absolutists, right? So he basically and believes in the idea of the old way, right? So he believes that like nobles and absolutists when working together to suppress human rights will actually prevent death in the long run which is ridiculous to think of. I can't imagine going into the Founding Fathers and being like, well, Thomas, there's this guy named Metternich who disagrees with you, okay? Like, so, like, you can't actually, like, believe it. Well, then again, the Founding Fathers were also just a bunch of rich guys that didn't want to pay taxes. So maybe that's just, like, an apple and an apple. I mean, not, like, the whole thing. Now, this next term I'm about to talk about is really, really important to understand, but it's not something you're ever going to want to actually, like, put on an AP test, right? Because it's a word I came up with. So the big thing that Metternich hates and his biggest weakness is he fears this thing that I, Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry calls it conservative kryptonite. Now, if you don't know what kryptonite is, here is a look at what kryptonite is. Uh, 
I told you. That's kryptonite, Superman. A little souvenir from the old hometown. I've spared no expense to make you feel right at home. So that's kryptonite, right? This green rock that like destroys and saps the power of Superman, right? So the thing about it is, if Superman is the conservatives, these two things combine together to create that said kryptonite, right? And those two things that come together to create conservative kryptonite are self-determination and constitutions, right? So let's define one of these things particularly. You know what a constitution is. You know the idea that the socialists and the classical liberals agree that they both want constitutions that limit the power of nobles, limit the power of absolutists, limit the power of these other land-holding classes, and they want to make sure that they have rights and suffrage and things like that. They might not agree on what should be in those constitutions, those classical liberals and socialists, but they do believe that constitutions are the only thing to take down conservative power. And they're not wrong, which will come up later when we get to 1848. Now, the other thing, though, is that they also believe that conservative kryptonite is made up of self-determination. Self-determination is the idea that a group of people, if they so choose, that want to become a country of their own should be allowed to go off and do that, right? So it would be kind of like the idea that the AP class, we exist in Archbishop Chappelle. We're going to pretend for a moment that Archbishop Chappelle is like the Austrian Empire, right? It controls people of many different races and ethnicities and languages and cultures and things like that. But we, the AP European classroom, feel as though with our common language and our common culture and our common dress and our common music and things like that, we believe that we want to separate ourselves from this Chappellian empire and create our own country and we are self-determining, right? So we would create ourselves as the 523 Republic, which is the number on my classroom, which you probably forgot a long time ago. Or we would call it Terriopolis or something like that. I think that has a nice ring to it. But the big thing about that is that is self-determination. The idea of creating countries on your own with its own constitutions, with their own rules, with their own ideas. And that freaks conservatives out a lot because for that to happen, for Italy to become a self-determined country, for Germany to become a self-determined country, that means Austria has to lose land. And conservatives do not want that to happen, especially Metternich being the Austrian foreign minister. Now, he united the conservatives that were even enemies, right? He united conservatives upon lines of suppressing revolt. The Russians and the Ottomans have hated each other's guts since Peter the Great. Peter the Great won a very large battle at the port of Azov, right? Had access to the Black Sea. Said that that's not a warm water port good enough for me. Goes and actually takes over land from Finland. But the Russians and the Ottomans had a back and forth, hated each other's guts, and literally fought entire wars against each other and had a massive rivalry, right? Well, the thing is, is Metternich was able to reconcile their differences in the idea of retaining the old order. They were like, hey, Russians and Ottomans, now that the French Revolution has happened and people want constitutions and liberties and freedoms, maybe you guys should come together to prevent that from happening. And it worked. The Russians and the Ottomans actually entered into agreements to prevent the like vivisection and taking away of different landholding areas and rights from their places, right? So when I'm talking about self-determination too, just getting at it, this is all the stuff that they were trying to prevent. When you actually look at this thing, look at the size of the Austrian Habsburg Empire. This is what it looked like. But every other color that's not green are people that aren't Austrian. There are people like, for example, Hungary, who speak Hungarian. And then you've got Transylvania, which actually is a like a technically a Slavic country that also is a part of Romania. You've got Bosnians and Croatians and Serbs and Slovenians. And you've got all these other people that are a part of these empires. And maybe what if they want their own countries? Now they're going to be self-determined, right? So get those conservative powers together, and they'll actually make sure that that doesn't happen. And then you'll get this, the Concert of Europe. There you go. Yeah, I hope you like that Tchaikovsky walk to flowers, but that's the big thing about it, is that the idea is this is the Concert of Europe. Metternich is working towards this idea of having the great powers play in a certain tone and all the sections match up so that that concert will continue to suppress workers and business people alike, right? Middle class and lower class, you don't get to come to this concert. You just get to watch while the rich people have said concert, right? Now, the thing about it is, though, is there's, a, like, there's our little like test to make sure that we were working hard, right? So, What's a big thing he wants to do then? He wants to repress revolutions. He wants to prevent 
anyone from popping up that would maybe want to have a revolution or have anything like the French Revolution ever again. So what Metternich's goal is, is let us make, let's make sure that all the conservative powers of Europe are going to prevent a French Revolution from ever occurring again, right? And so what they're trying to do is they're basically trying to fight off this idea known as the dual revolution, right? That is the economic and political changes, a.k.a. bullying his toothpaste, that uh, fuse and reinforce ideas of socialism and liberalism, right? So I'm not kidding. I'm bringing that tube of toothpaste to school on Monday when we see each other again. And I still want to challenge Godet and, like, uh, Katie Pertweet to have two tools to get that toothpaste back in that tube, right? So, like, use the weekend to try and find your tools. Now, the big thing, though, is these economic and political changes that were brought on by the French Revolution, the ideas of constitutions and Napoleonic warfare and, like, building new states in Europe and actually having legislative bodies and suffrage and stuff like that, people having rights that are bestowed upon them by a revolution— that's what he wants to prevent, right? So the dual revolution, the reason why it's called dual or two, is because it's the economic and political changes, right? The old order, the, er the aristocrats and the kings, that means that, oh, no more mercantilism, we're now doing free market. That's the economic changes. No more you own all the land and no one else gets anything. We now want private property for bourgeois members. And then the socialists are like, no private property for anyone, which scares the bejesus out of conservatives, right? So the thing about it, though, is you've also got liberal alliances versus the holy alliance, right? Now, team liberal, what I mean by that is basically anyone that's a part of the middle class or the bourgeois throughout Europe are now getting ideas in their heads. And they're like, wait a minute. We could be our own country. We could be our own people. We all speak Italian, but we're ruled over by the Austrians, right? Those people are going to start squaring off against what's known as the Holy Alliance, a.k.a. the alliance within the alliance, right? So there was the quadruple alliance that we know as Great Britain, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, right? Like basically Great Britain in the ears. So, like, though they are doing this, remember, we look back at that Concert of Europe map, Britain is still located far away. Britain is still all the way over on its island, minding its own business, having its big boats, and doing all this other stuff, right? So the thing about it is, is the Holy Alliance is created on the continent of Europe. And that Holy Alliance is Prussia, Russia, and Austria. They call themselves the Holy Alliance because they work directly with the churches that they actually sanction, Russia being the Eastern Orthodox, Prussia being like the Lutherans and the Protestant faiths, and Austria being still very, 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 very Catholic. They actually are called the Holy Alliance because they're the ones that are like enforcing strict religious rules as well as strict conservative rules, right? So <clears throat> their goal, this Holy Alliance, is to stop all rising constitutional systems as they come up. That's them right there, right? They're showing up like, oh, we're here for your betterment. We're here to help you because constitutions are bad for you. That's how Elmo feels about that, right? So now also, I don't know if y'all seen this whole like Rocco thing. Apparently Elmo hates this character named Rocco, but it's like a whole thing that my wife showed me. It's absolutely hilarious. Now, like the big thing about it though is destroying all those rising constitutional systems. And you have two good examples of this. In the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, those places united together and basically wrote their own constitution and were on the way to creating their own new country known as the kingdom of the two sicilies that would have been basically the seed of an italian government going forward and then also spain actually brought in a ruler that was in favor of constitutions democratic elections and also creating new like parts and pieces of their empires so what ends up happening though is that the holy alliance amasses armies and they send them in and they suppress these things they take rulers out of power, they burn those constitutions, they get rid of all these concepts, right? That right there is the big thing. Now, some of you are probably like, that doesn't sound too much like the age of Metternich piece to me. It sounds like you're going in and still being violent. And to be honest, they were. They still were doing those things, right? So going forward, though, you okay? Just make sure, sorry. Going forward, though, you have to also understand that Metternich even took on newer, more direct, more like kind of disgusting roots to like root out these ideas of revolution and stuff like that. So what ends up going on, for example, are these things known as the Carlsbad Decrees, right? So like the Carlsbad Decrees were two different things in two different tandems, right? Not so much this, but all like later on. They want to reorganize the German principalities into 38 member states, and they were originally 90. Now, a big thing coming down the pipe is going to be that this guy is going to organize those now 38 member states into what would be known as the German Empire and create Germany out of that. But the Carlsbad Decrees also did something else very, very important. It established a system of rooting out 
subversive ideas, right? So the Carlsbad Decrees actually outlawed fraternities at many universities out and put spies inside of university classrooms and to try and spy on pr like professors who were teaching liberal ideas, right? So the Carlsbad Decrees were like these things to basically directly spy on the intellectual like places throughout Europe at these universities and prevent the spread of liberal ideas. So as you can see, Metternich's roots are all up in the infrastructure of Europe. And he's really using them to root out any of these negative ideas that he doesn't agree with. So conservative, conservatism in Europe is using its last giant attempt to try and prevent the spread of liberalism and socialism during so now what we're going to talk about is even though Metternich is trying his best to prevent the spread of ideas, outlawing fraternities, spying on professors, spying on classrooms, like reorganizing German principalities, doing all these things to try and prevent a revolution from ever happening again, there's still some like viruses out there, right? Like we have some issues that are going to affect Metternich's abilities to be able to grow at the rate or suppress at the rate that he wants to do that at. Dude, sit down. You've been annoying the daylights out of everybody today. Now, going forward, though, let's look at the true virus that Metternich is never going to be able to fight. Much like COVID, literally, this virus is popping up that's destroying empires and destroying conservatives in the old way of things. And it's called nationalism, right? Nationalism is growing so quickly that they can't prevent it from stopping like any new revolutions or any new reorganization of states, and it will never prevent self-determination, right? Nationalism is the idea that each people have its own genius. So do me a favor and highlight that word genius, right? They have their own genius, their own unity, their own common language, their own common history, their own common identity, right? So for example, this idea is growing in places like Germany. It's growing in places like Italy and throughout other areas of Europe. And so during this period, this is going to lead to so many of those states trying to self-determine and create independent countries, right? And so during that period, you're going to see new places like try to rise up and revolt, like the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies and like these other places. And you're going to see like the German principalities start getting these ideas of creating a one unified German state. Now, they're beginning to grow though, mainly just because there are too few states and way too many ethnic groups, right? When we looked at that map of like the like Austria, for example, the Austrian Empire, when you look at this map, look at this. You've got all these different ethnic groups controlled by just this one area, right? So you got way too many ethnic groups and cultures out there that are being controlled by way too few people. Because when we look at that Concert of Europe map, there's only like seven countries on that whole continent. And in the modern day era, there's over 28, right? So like that is a big example. Like the map of Europe today is the self-determined national nationalist map of Europe. The map that we're looking at now, the Concert of Europe map, that's the conservative dream map, right? So linking this all idea up with classical liberals is going to be a really big thing because classical liberals are big fans of nationalism. Add that to your chart. Classical liberals are big fans of nationalism, right? Because it supports their general idea of like suffrage to an extent, supports their idea of unity to an extent, and supports all their ideas socialists are actually not that big of fans of nationalism because they believe that all working men are united together regardless of their language, right? So, like, that'll come up a lot when we talk about Marx. Marx is very anti-nationalist. He does not like the ideas of nationalism, right? So, going forward, though, these movements, though, they don't really, like, erupt until, like, the later 1800s. But the big thing you need to know is that during the 1800s and following the Congress of Vienna, these ideas are spreading. And that's all that's even more deadly sometimes than in when the uh, actual movements erupt on their own, okay? So going forward, though, as well, you have to understand, too, this is the other virus that's coming for you, conservatives. The ideas and, I, like, guidance and the understanding of socialism, right? So socialism, you have got to stop. You are freaking out. You need to just take a nap. You need to take a nap. I know that you're you're not a socialist. I know you don't like it, but you, you got to listen, okay? You got to listen. You got to take a nap. Now, the big thing about it, though, is he's running around. He's freaking out. Socialism was the massive backlash against individualism of the Industrial Revolution, okay? So you're going to see socialism become much more organized during the Industrial Revolution. But you're seeing the earliest forms of socialism pop up really kind of close to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Like Jean-Jacques Rousseau is sometimes considered like the proto-socialist, the earliest one, because of that general will concept and universal suffrage, universal decisions made by groups of people. You're seeing the fragmentation of society as well create a distinct class now that is of the lower working class, right? So because of that, since the middle class is growing, it's leaving the working class behind. Since the working class is being left behind, they're now creating socialist ideas, right? 
And this whole thing is a move towards cooperation and a sense of community. Now remember though, there are socialist things that they hate. You don't necessarily need to write this down, but they hate class structure, they hate private property, and they hate free markets, right? They want everyone to work together because they like government intervention, economic planning, and universal suffrage. Remember, we already wrote these down on our charts, so you don't necessarily need to write those things down. But when you really look at earliest socialist movements, you gotta understand where they're coming from too. Now, where do you think socialism truly began? That is exactly right, Kayla Giardina. It's going to start off in France, right? It's going to start off in France because that, of course, is where the bedrock of this entire understanding and idea is because we believe, like I said, Jean-Jacques Rousseau may have been like one of our earliest socialists, right? So you've got the earliest ideas of socialism popping up. Now, the very first socialist sphere thing to pop up is this thing called French utopian socialism. Do you remember that concept of the bread of equality? That's a big thing about French utopian socialism. They believe that bread prices should be set. They believe that all things should go towards the working man and rather than the, than the collective, rather than the individual. Because socialism is born out of fear of individualism, right? Socialism and the French revolutionaries are like, if we allow people to actually be individual figures like a Robespierre, like Danton, like Louis, like Lafayette, like any of those guys, then we leave the collective behind, right? Which is another big thing as well, that they're like, same thing. If we have a laissez-faire economics, we are going to get left behind because it's going to be all about the betterment of their companies rather than the betterment of the people in general, right? So revolutionary thinkers are going to demand that governments run the economy. No more capitalism, no more of that stuff. Run the economy because competition is just going to fracture a community and lead to all of us competing against each other. Like Pierre right here is going to create his own company against my other dog, Josie, and this leads to a fractioning in our house because he's trying to make his money hoping that her system fails, right? These are the things that socialists fear, and they believe that free market capitalism and conservatives alike, along with classical liberals, are leaving the world behind. Key elements of socialism do, do also include economic equality, planned economies, no more state or regulated or state and regulated property, no more private property, right? Now, the very first guy to actually write this stuff down is a guy named Count Henri de Saint Simon, who literally was a participant in the revolution, was actually a part of some of the legislative bodies. He was very, very famous for outlining the concepts of socialism into two different groups. He called them parasites and doers, right? He said the only way that socialism will actually continue to exist under the utopian model would be that if we get rid of the parasites, right? And the parasites are the church, lawyers, aristocracy, absolutists, nobles, people with privilege, all those people just suck off of the like work of others, right? He kind of defined aristocrats of being the people that like live in their giant homes with all their jewelry, their things, their food, their stuff, while the working man is the one that provided that stuff and money for them, right? That they would actually be out there in a field if those working men were not providing the things for them that they were making all that money off of. Now, the interesting thing is that you would think, <coughs> according to this, that maybe his doers are those working men, but they're not. The doers, according to St. Simon, are actually scientists, engineers, industrialists, the intelligent in society, who are supposed to redirect their intelligence to the betterment of the common man, right? And so in that process, he had faith that the doers would morally try to help the poor and create this thing known as the age of gold. Now, unfortunately, he was wrong, right? So, like, we've had doers around for a long time, and a lot of time when doers get, like, money and things waved in their face and economic competition waved in their face, they kind of get really excited about it, and they still tend to leave the poor behind. So, unfortunately, his ideas didn't work out. But still, in the lofty ideas of socialism, it still sounds like it would be awesome. But then this guy comes along. His name is Fourier. And after the Congress of Vienna he and the growth of industrialism that he's now beginning to see infiltrate the continent, and we'll talk about in our next class, industrial, the Industrial Revolution in general, he believes that the growth of socialism is going to, to like try and actually like make everything worse. He believes capitalism will become more entrenched. That if like capitalism were a, was a plant, that industrialism is its fertilizer, and that that plant needs to be clipped out so its weeds do not grow. Right. So like socialists turn to try and attack capitalism in general, and so Fourier took everything a step further, and he was a part of this new wave of thinkers. Like he wants to do crazy stuff, intense stuff. He one wants to abolish marriage because he says that is a man trying to claim ownership or property rights over a woman and so he wants no more marriage ever he only wants the procreation of people should the community need it not necessarily just out of like arrangements and feudal understandings of dowries and like trying to like create like ownership of women he also believes that all places all large cities throughout europe should be broken up into smaller communities the smaller communities were going to be called 
phalanxes. Phalanxes would be like walled in little communities of only about 1,620 people and everyone would have a job and everyone would do their job to keep the community going, right? Like you'd have a farmer and a planter and a pot maker and a rope maker and a soap maker and everybody would do their work and contribute to the common good and they would only procreate if needed to keep that number at the stable margin and they would like instruct and teach each other these different crafts, right? Sounds all well and good. And the funny thing about it is, is like on top of other reforms that he came up with, which we'll talk about a few more of those in class, he then said, and when we accomplish this, we will enter into the age of prosperity. And he literally in one of his writings said, and the Mediterranean and the seas will fill with lemonade. He actually thought that the seas would fill with lemonade if you actually did these few things, right? That like, oh, well, I'm sure it's a metaphor and he didn't actually think it was going to fill with lemonade, but he's saying like the age of prosperity is upon us when we abolish marriage, abolish private property, abolish like large, like huge socialist areas and go back to more rural roots. This guy, Fourier, big Rousseau fan. He's looking at Emile right now. He's reading that book and he's being like, like man is born free but everywhere is in chains he is in chains because society put him there now saint simone's followers do not agree they believe take the infrastructure that you already have and make the best out of it right take the industrials and get them to help the poor so we're seeing a division of socialism we're seeing people pop up that think they have more extreme versions of socialism rather than others and that's where you're going to get your marxian socialists who pop up in that void okay so that is going to be where we wrap up i'll see y'all soon y'all have a good one